St. Paul tells us that he is straining for what lies ahead. Hymn 663. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, for giving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and he hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard what more was there to do for my vineyard than I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. 
I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are its pleasant planting. He expected justice, but, sh but saw bloodshed. Righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is a portion of Psalm 80, found in your bulletin. We'll read it together in unison. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow, and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea, and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall, so that all who pass by pluck off its grapes? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it. The beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, Look down from heaven, behold and tend this vine, preserve what your right hand has planted. A reading from the book of Philippians. If anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press onward toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of, of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to the tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and we will get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the time of harvest. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in your eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruit of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and will crush anyone who falls upon it. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him. But they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, one of the, one of the blessings, perhaps the greatest blessing of the repetition of scripture. You know, that feeling that you have heard this before, even when you may not have heard it before, you recognize it, but you don't. What it is, it's the story or the process that's going on. It's the, it's the thing that's happening in the story that seems to repeat itself over and over again from the very beginning until the very end. In fact, there's a couple of themes that never stop repeating. And the, one of the themes is, is the heart of the, of the focus of the scriptures for today. And when it's often heard in scripture, it's often feared or disliked, a terrible thing to say, a horrible thing to hear. How can that be, or how can we listen to that, or it can't be that way if God's doing it? And yet it is repeated over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I can tell you that the origination of this lesson or of this example of living to us is finds its roots in our nature. It's speaking, as the scripture does, directly to sin nature, our brokenness. From that time all the way back, remember Adam and Eve in the very beginning in Genesis, where, where the relationship between God and humankind was broken. And the effects of that brokenness within the context of the individual, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, and those who follow, that includes us, is that this nature draws us into a myopic uh, self, self view, selfishness, self centered, self focused, self wanting. This is literally the I want place of our life. This is the place in us that pulls us and draws us all the time. It can be a little, we live with it all the time, we really do. It can be a little thing like, like when you go to a, 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 a maybe a church program, a, a church thing downstairs, like, like the like what we're going to have next. And maybe it's a, a time where it's, it, the food's prepared. And as you, as you get ready to go in line, you look, you're looking in line, the food's nice over here, but you happen to spy over there on that table, the dessert table. There's like this, these cookies that you really like. They're those little lemon cookies that are only made. There's not a whole lot of them. It's like 50 cookies. It's like 10 cookies on a, on a plate. And they're the ones you really want. And so as you're going through the line here and you're saying hello and saying how you're doing, in the back of your mind, you're thinking about those lemon cookies and hoping that they're going to be there when you get there because you want that lemon cookie. 
And by the time you turn from the, from the food table to the cookie table and it's there, you look straight for it. You don't look at anything else. Your eyes go right to the lemon cookies and you realize they're there and you feel, oh, I've got my lemon cookie. And then you may even get to that plate and instead of taking one, you take three because they're your favorite. It's a little thing. It's a tiny little thing. But if you are conscious of it, what it points to is this nagging center of I want in me. If this is not controlled, if it blossoms and flowers, if it moves outward from me, it becomes something heinous and horrible. In a little child with a parent who does not control this appetite within a child, and they become something. What do we used to call them? I don't know what they call them today, but we used to call them a brat. Nobody wanted to be around this kid because the kid did whatever he wanted or she wanted to do, took what they wanted, put their hands in the salad. I, I had a, a, an in-law who's in the middle of this, in the conversation with the mother, didn't want to play with mom and walked right up between us and drove her hand right into the dip, up to the knuckle. Over and over, three times before the mother got up, she would just wipe it off and keep talking. When they get big, we call that a narcissist. Somebody who defines the world by what they want, defines the world around them by what they do, defines everything through their own perspective of what is good for them. Everything in between the bride and the narcissist, as it moves and as it gets its way, is, is undesirable. It's not good. The scripture is filled and littered over and over again with God reacting to, to the sin nature winning in the context of the people, the children of Israel the, the, and Judea. And yet we have psalms like this. Listen to this. This is the last two verses of Psalm 118. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. If you are feeling disconnected, if you're feeling down, if you're feeling you need a little, little pick-me-up, read Psalm 118. It is absolutely beautiful. It is one of the pre preeminent praise psalms in Scripture. This is presumably David who wrote this along with the others. This is the last psalm of a group of psalms called the Hillel. From Psalm 113 to 118, these are praise psalms. 118 itself, so precious that it is routinely sung, parts and in whole, at weddings, at bar mitzvahs, at the installation of, of, of uh, those who work in the temple, cantors. It is there for when buildings are dedicated, when homes are blessed. It is sung or read over and over again. At weddings, it's a favorite. It's like, you know, we have Corinthians. This is one of the psalms that is read or sung at weddings. Keep 118 in mind. Maybe one day in heart. This psalm is important in its praise along with those, all those others back to Psalm 113 because of this witness. This witness that we're given so graphically today in that first lesson from Isaiah. God speaking through Isaiah about God's own creation. So God says, Isaiah says, Let me sing of my beloved a love song concerning his vineyard. And he says... My beloved had a vineyard on a forest hill and goes on ready. He dug it, he cleared it, he planted it with choice vines, and he built a watchtower. This is a very specific word in the Hebrew. He built a watchtower in the midst of it. And he hewed out a wine vat in it, and he expected it to yield grapes. But it yielded wild grapes. I'm going to add a little picture for you to this, to this, uh, this parable that's taught. So you have, you have the, the vineyard owner who's done everything. Everything that can be done. It's a beautiful vineyard, very high tech. The right seeds, the right vines coming up, everything is as it should. And as the vines grow and they begin to give fruit, instead of growing the good grape, it grows the nasty grape. The wild, wild grapes are un, inedible, and they certainly can't be used for wine. They're, they're not the kind of grapes you go by and pick. They're ugh. It's as if it's as if the grapes themselves made a choice. The grape was coming out, it was in the vine, it was about to flourish and come out as a grape, and it said, I don't want to be a grape. I want to be a peach. The best peach in the world. 
or I want to be a tomato, or I want to be an apple, I'm going to be the best pear there ever was. And it comes out, pa da But a grape that doesn't want to be a grape cannot be a pear or a tomato or anything else. A grape that doesn't want to be a grape will simply be a bad grape, a grape that's less than a grape. And so the grapes that came from these vines, not wanting to be a grape, came out as bad grapes. The question is asked, how can this happen? God says, how can this happen when I have made everything right? I have given everything to everyone so that they may come to me and be the best thems they can be. My children flourishing on the vine. My children growing and becoming and knowing me and prospering. How can it be that they don't do that unless they don't want to? They don't become better somewhere else. They just become less of what they're supposed to be. This turning away from God, this is the focus or the outliving of that sin nature I have everything I want. Look at this world. It's an oyster for me. Things are great. I just don't need God. I've got everything else. Fine soil, good hedge grove. Everything is going my way. What is God useful for now? If I don't give God the credit for planting me, for tilling the soil, for protecting me, then God is worthless because I'm going to tell myself I did it all myself. I'm going to take credit for it. I'm going to be the captain of my own ship, the director of my own destiny. You know, the strength, my strength, my strength employed to my salvation will lead only to my damnation. Let's say it again. My strength employed to my salvation will only lead to my damnation. I cannot save myself. I can fool myself and say that I can but I'm just a bad grape thinking I'm a pear. It doesn't work that way. God is the, is the originator and the saver, the salvific one. We need God. We must have God. So God calls the people over and over. In, in the psalm that we read, you heard the very next after this, after what's happening in here. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. It's the people that I have made, that have turned away from me, that have left me, that have gone astray. And then the psalmist for today says, oh God, how is this happening? You've planted us. You've made this. You brought us out of Egypt. You put us here. We spread all over the place. And yet now the wall's broken down and everything is just picking us apart. Come here. Say, say, preserve what your right hand has planted. The psalmist does not even recognize the corruption of the vineyard. The psalmist thinks it's God's fault. God's on a golf trip or, or somewhere. He's just not paying attention and the wall broke down. The psalmist is not putting the responsibility where the responsibility is due within the context of the life of God's own people, even though God says it over and over again. You know, this came up in the book of Isaiah in the first chapter. First chapter, this is what God said to the children of Israel and Judea in the first chapter. Hear me, listen. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master and the donkey knows its manager, but Israel, my children, do not know me and they do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children of corruption. They have forsaken me. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel. They have turned their backs on me. This is not God. This is the people. Again, it is a sad story that happens over and over where the individual peoples rely upon themselves for their salvation, move away from the protection of God, and turn to themselves to rule the world. And it doesn't work all the way up until the time of Christ. And we hear this vineyard coming back. You know, these aren't the only times we hear about the vineyard. It comes back through Scripture all the time. It's a wonderful illustration. So Jesus now is standing. He's been talking to this same group. If you look at the top of the page, it says, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard the parables. That's who he's talking to. So when it starts, he says, Jesus said, who's he said it to? He's saying it to them and to the people that are listening. Listen to another parable. Now he'll listen to the beginning. 
There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and put what? A watchtower. Those who were listening to this, especially the Pharisees and the temple priests, they would understand that this is referencing that parable in Isaiah, that one about the watchtower, that unusual word that's used only in here. And Jesus then moves on to talk about the same or companion events about this, this wine grower, this man who, let's just say it's you. You have invested all of this in a vineyard. You have made it. You, it's high tech. You've got the whole thing done. You've got the watchtower. You've got the press. You've got the walls built up. You've got everything done. And you find tenants because you have other things to do. You're an entrepreneur and you've got to go invest someplace else. So you have it all done. Now here's the part that's left out. You built a silo and you filled it with everything that they need to take care of the vineyard. And you're giving them a stipend to live on. We know that must be the case, further into the parable, because these grapes take two to four years, the vines, to produce a grape. So they're not just giving it to them and leaving and then it's going to grow grapes. It's going to be three years from now. And they're going to live there for three years, which they have done. So they've lived there for three years, happy with their silo, with everything provided for them and their stipend. Life is good. No worries. And yet... Their plan turns from thanksgiving. Their plan turns from looking to the vineyard owner as the wonderful individual who has provided for them to themselves. I want. I want the whole thing. I want it for myself. I want this to be mine. Sin nature takes over. Selfishness intercedes. And suddenly I don't care about the one who's taken me off the street or given me a place to live or provided me the place or a nice place to live who's given me an occupation. Now I'm just thinking about how I can get more. beatings and death and what kind of insanity is this you see how the insanity is pushed right here in scripture somehow in some strange universe they have thought that if they kill the heir they become the heir so you're the vineyard owner and you send your son and i'm going to kill your son and after i kill your son you're going to make me the heir of the vineyard where did that come from What what universe is that going to work in? It's not. But I can't see straight. I can't hear straight. I can't understand the world because I'm looking at everything through my want, my desire, my perspective, my thing, and I will create a scenario that supports everything for me. Jesus gets down to the bottom, he says, he put the wretches, the the Pharisees say, he'll put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to tenants who will give them the produce of uh, his produce at harvest time. And Jesus doesn't say anything. He just says, have you never heard the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. Isn't not amazing in our eyes? Now for you and I, that sounds like an obscure passage. At least we know the stone thing, right? But where did it come from? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad in it. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. He has made his light shine upon us with bows in hand. Join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You ready? You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. This is Psalm 118. This is the most popular celebration psalm in the Jewish repertoire. This is at the heart of this psalm. That the, that the stone that the builders rejected would become the chief cornerstone. Their mind would have to go directly to this psalm, a psalm that they sang all the time, a song they recited all the time. Could they not place this psalm within the context of what Jesus is saying? Or if they placed it, could they not understand it? This is the Lord's doing, he says. Sadly, you know what they do? They confirm that they are lost in their sinfulness by what they do next. They fear the people. They don't apply the words of Scripture. 
They just live through it or walk through it like it's nothing because it doesn't fit what they want. See this beautiful thing right here on the cover? That's the stone the builders rejected. <laughs> you know, we think that the stone the builder rejected is just because it's not big enough. And that may be part of it. You know, I, I need a big cornerstone, and this one's only this big, so I'm rejecting that one. But then I finally get a big one. It's the right size, but I reject it anyway. Why? What's the orange stuff? Any guess? Iron. Iron in the Jewish belief system is a death metal. It creates swords. It creates pots and pans, too. But it's the only thing that creates weapons of death. And since they're building, they're building a place of life like the temple, they will not accept a stone with iron in it, even a little bit. Any iron in the stone, and it's rejected. But all the way back in this psalm and in other places, and now out of the mouth of Jesus and reaffirmation, the stone that had the iron in it is the stone that has been resurrected, the stone that has been taken in by God. What this means, that the determination of the people of Israel way back and through time to say that we won't take a stone because it carries this element is wrong. That there's something more that God has planned for the people. Something more that includes iron. Maybe it is that God is looking at this iron not simply as a, 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 a component to death, but also pots and pans, a component to life. It's not the element itself that causes death, it's what we do with it. Do I live out my sin nature and kill? Or do I live out my, my depth of, of longing for God and, and save? It's, it's not the element. Jesus is bringing a new understanding into the world about who God is and what God has planned for everyone. Paul tries to express this in his letter to the Philippians. We already know this letter. We've been reading it for several weeks. We know what's going on. He's in prison, and they've written to him. And there is this amazing concern, and rightly so, because they're writing to him, and they've said, there is this thing that's happening here. Where is it? There are men here who are leading the church. There are men here who have come up, and they're charismatic, and they're important, and they're leading the church. But they're leading it away from God. They're leading it away from Christ. They're saying, I have the way. I have the sight. I know what's right and what's wrong. And so this is the way we should go. And they've written to Paul and they said, that's not the way you said to go. We don't think we should go that way. What should we do? And Paul understands it right away. We want what we want. What's comfortable for me is comfortable for me. And if I'm leading, I want what's comfortable for me for everybody else. And so they take the church the wrong way. Paul comes back and says, they are the authority, right? Well, guess what? I have a greater authority. I am one of the preeminent Jews that ever lived. I am on or was on the way to becoming the high priest of the temple. And he was. This is an incredible resume. And everybody knew it. He says, if you're going to believe anybody because they claim authority, believe me. Now listen to me, if I was selfish, if I followed my sin nature, that's what I'd be doing right now, killing Christians and heading for the high priesthood. But I don't listen to myself, I listen to Jesus Christ, I listen to my Lord and Savior, and I have given up all of my credentials and all of my living, I count everything as rubbish, trash. The only thing I hold dear now is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The only thing I hold now is what God can give me, the components that God can show me, the way of living that God can lead me into. I fight this with my own sin nature, but I'm giving myself over to God, not just as an action, not as just as a word, not as something that I'm doing so that y'all you know, might follow me over there into the toolies, but down here, deep inside in that groaning pit that's inside of us. And we all know that too, when we want something or we see something or there's a tragic event in our life like a family member, I have seen this. You may have felt it or you may have had it. When something happens to someone that we love, I have watched people bend over with that weight that wells up in the center of them. The longing, the desire, the hope in here. This is what Paul is talking about. This is what God is calling us to. This is what Jesus is speaking of. This place inside 
that we connect with God, understand and behold to God all that we are and all that we have. We say that in the wedding service, don't we? All that I am and all that I have, I honor you. We take this place in the, in the, in the marriage ceremony and give ourselves over, recognizing this place of giving within the context of our relationship, not taking. Paul wants to drive this point home so much that he uses these words, forgetting what lies behind, all of the accolades I've gotten or the ones that I would have gotten, and straining here, down in here, straining to go forward to Christ, what lies ahead in him, here living. I live out of here. I press on to the goal, the prize of the heavenly call in Christ Jesus. The only way to combat, to persevere beyond the self-focus, the wants and the desires of our nature is in Christ. That's what God's told us in Scripture, what Christ has told us in Scripture, what Paul and the others witnessed to us in Scripture, and what we really do know in our own life. This is not bad news. The witness is not scandalous. It's wonderful news. We're not alone. We're not special because we think of ourselves. We're not special because we're in a place of indecision. We're favored by God who said, I plant you and I will tend you forever if we just give ourselves over to God's offer. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. Please stand with me. Together we will say the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe, Spirit, only the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are form six, found in your bulletin. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For 
for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. For all who serve God in this church. For the special needs and, co and concerns of this congregation, especially those on the parish family list, Chester, Darian, Thomas, Caleb, Marion, Laurie, Mike, Kathy, Vanessa, Sue, Bill, Father Bill, Chester, Melanie, Ann Lynn, and Sharon. And for those on our extended family list, and for those in our hearts, either spoken aloud or silently in prayer. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We, put their trust in you. we pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And all with you. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for always praying for the prayer list. Wonderful. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, dear. Good morning. Please be seated. So many announcements, so little time. So we've got these uh, announcements. If we go down the, we're in uh, screw tape on Wednesday night. We're in letters four and five. I think this week we've done. One and two and three. So if you want to join us, please do. Wonderful. 7 o'clock to 7.30 is our gathering. 7.30 to 8.30 is our class that we're taking, we're doing. Thursday night Bible study. I believe that this, sun, this Thursday will be the last night for Tobit. So the week after this, I believe, will be the time when we decide on our next book. So I will remind, remind you next week that if you want to get into the Bible study, we choose the, the books we're reading by the people who want to read them. So come, come and join us in the Bible study so that you'll have a chance to throw in the, into, the, into the mix the Bible book that you want to read, that you think we need to study, and perhaps that'll be the one we do. The only way we know is if you're there. Stu.
Outstanding. Yes, yes. Sell, sell, sell. And volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Wonderful. All right. We're, we're powering on on the adult forum. That's 9.30 to 10.15. We're doing a short course in Christianity. We started last week with prehistory, God before creation. And today we went into the book of uh, Genesis. We're going to go next week from Genesis 1 to Genesis 9. The core of this thing is for all of us that if we do not begin with a firm understanding of who God is, what God planned, and how God wanted to do it, then you know that phone game? By the time we get to where we are, we're going to be considering and thinking and praying to God or a God that's not God because the God is not the God in the scripture that we understand. So come next week, 9.30 to 10.15, just the first nine chapters of the book of Genesis. We're not reading them. We are looking at God's uh, uh, revelation of God's self within the context of the beginning of uh, ordered creation of humankind. And then we'll move on from there. We're going to wind up within 10 or 14 weeks at, to today. We're going to go through uh, scripture, uh, little theology, scripture, history, uh, polity, church, and us. All the way up. Uh, prayer list, MSEF, volunteers, online giving. Any other announcements? Yes. <laughs> All right. Any other announcements? I have two, two announcements for you. One is a, a local announcement of what's going on here. So we have the boiler guy uh, who's putting in our boilers, and he's going to start this week. So hopefully we'll have, uh, he said, a week to 10 days. He believes two weeks at the outside if there's some kind of um, machinery problem, like he can't get a, a bend in a pipe or something. So I'm hoping that within, uh, not next week, pray for good weather next week. This is fine weather in here, I think. But in two weeks, we'll have our new boilers up and running. So we should be good to go. So that's good. We're coming to the end of a long journey, I think, on that. The second one is we're praying for, what, for the people of Israel and what's going on, but I want to make sure that we continue to pray for the people of Palestine. In fact, all people in all uh, conflicts around the world, on, on any side, the, the people of Israel, people of Russia, people of uh, Ukraine, people of Palestine, all need our prayers, especially the innocents that are caught up within the context of these conflicts. Uh, I, I am... I have been close to Israel for a long time. I have been and spent time in Israel. Uh, it's, it is a desperate place. It's a desperate place around Israel. You, we, you may not remember or know that uh, Israel is the most sanctioned nation on earth by the UN for human rights violations because they have never been out of sanction. They sanctioned every quarter, every year since 1966. There are binders of UN sanctions against Israel. There are multiple treaties and, and agreements that are being broken constantly and consistently. And you know them because you hear about it. When you hear that Israel has built a new settlement in the West Bank, the West Bank in totality is property of the Palestinian people. There's no dispute about this, not a single dispute about this. Israel is overtly building settlements in land that does not belong to them and is refusing to give it back. In fact, they have accelerated their settlement building. It, at the time that I was there, it was called the 30-year plan. So 20 years ago when I was there, they were talking about doing this. And what they're doing is they get Jerusalem here and they're going further and further out with the settlements and making a, an ark. 
So they're just claiming everything inside the ark. And then they go out to the next ark. And then the next ark. And now think about being a Palestinian. And by the way, there's a lot of Palestinian Christians. We're not just talking about Muslims here. Now, you're looking at your land. Your land that's been given to you. Like, think about indigenous peoples in the United States, American Indians. Treaties by our government saying this is your land. And they're looking at their land and they're watching it being taken, chipped and sliced away, place by place by place by place. And nobody is doing anything about it except for sanctioning them, saying you can't do it. And nobody's, I, I question and I have questioned over the years, if this was happening in another country, if another country was just moving in and taking over because they wanted the land, I think the world would do something about it. Oh wait, <laughs> isn't that what's going on in Ukraine? Saying you can't do this, we won't let you just take over someone else's land. Israel's been doing this since 1966. Hamas is not, are not the people of Israel. Hamas is the militant far right side, and everybody's got a militant right side. We know that all too well. These people are doing terrible things, kidnapping and killing innocent people. But I fear for the rest of Palestine, because the response from Israel could be just incredible. The, 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 the dis the difference between the power structure in, in Palestine and Israel from a military perspective is staggering. And the people who are going to pay for it are the mothers and the children and the men who are just trying to live a life, like you and I, with children and with playgrounds and with schools and with jobs. So please, as we pray, pray for those in Palestine. Pray for those in Israel to stop doing what they're doing and provoking and continuing a, a desperate situation that just does not need to be this way. That there will be a world change for peace when we all know who we are and where we should be and how we should honor the commitments that we make. All right. Birthdays. Oh. Yes. Architecture. Oh my gosh, 40? Barkley? That's hard to believe. Are you sure that's right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, we'll pray for Barkley too in, in absentia. All right, tell everybody who you are and when's your birthday? My name is Sandy Wainwright. My birthday was yesterday. Outstanding. Let's pray for Sandy and Barkley. Gracious and loving Lord God, we thank you. We give you thanks and praise for your intervention in our lives, for your companionship along the way, for, for calling us again and again and again, and for leading us outside of ourselves and outside of our comfort zone to know and to love you and to see things ourselves and the world differently. We thank you so much for the presence of Sandy here with us, for the love that you have shown in her life, for the call to ministry and service that you've provided in her heart and her soul, and for her, her wonderful uh, gifts and responding to you here. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to continue to rest upon her and within her. Keep her strong in heart and mind and spirit. Enlighten her heart to your presence and lighten her load in the life that she lives. Give her your humor and your companionship, your safety and your love that she would know and would evermore and continually depend upon you. We ask you to fill her with wisdom as she orders her common life and that of her family. We ask you to fill her with patience and with energy and excitement about the coming days and uh, resolve for what must be. Lord, we also thank you this day for Barkley, for his 40 years, for his time among us when he was young, and for these days that he is now pursuing his degree in architecture we thank you, Lord, for giving him intelligence and desire that he might be and contribute to the world in this way. We ask you to continue to bless him and his family and to watch over him and keep him safe and strong that he might continue to graduate and to become uh, that which you have called him to be. Holy Trinity, we ask your blessing upon Sandy and Barclay, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this day and forevermore. Amen.
Yay, happy birthday. <laughs> Anniversaries. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and call us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. When we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this 
for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.